Boost of Provo. Also, also a dude. So these are both subjects that I spend a lot of time on. So the talk is going to be pretty high level, but there is code available if any of you are inspired to dig into the gory details. So first of all, let's um, quickly define what a linear program is. Uh, starting with the word program, because this means something different in our context than what we're used to. So we, we think of a program as a sequence of instructions they run on a computer. But in this context, a program is more like a problem statement. You have some sort of input variables that are denoted x here. And you want to choose values for those inputs so that you maximize or minimize some quantity. So in practice, often you'll want to maximize profits or minimize costs. But you have limited resources to do that with. And so you, um, you express your limited resources as constraints, which are shown here as the G functions, also under inputs. And then a linear program is just a, a special case of this, where um, the objective function that you're trying to maximize or minimize is um, a linear combination of the inputs, so just a weighted sum. And so are the constraints. It's all just linear combinations. And what this looks like um, is something like this. Here's a simple example where we have two variables, x1 and x2. And each constraint shown by these lines basically is a plane dividing your space of solutions in two. And it disqualifies half of that space on one side of the plane. So when you put a bunch of these together, they, where they intersect is the feasible region. So any solution to your problem has to fall in the feasible region, because that's where all the constraints are satisfied. And then I haven't drawn the objective function on here, but basically it defines a direction where the value that you want to maximize is increasing. So you can sweep that out. And the last place where it crosses out of the feasible region is the optimal solution to your problem at that point. So what can you do with the, these things? It turns out you can actually do a whole lot of things with them. I'm just going to give a few examples here. Um, the first one is you can choose your optimal diet. So let's say that you have a database of foods that you can buy. Each food has some price, and you have detailed nutritional information for each one. So the objective function here is you want to minimize the cost. So you're choosing some amount of each food product, multiplying those by the prices. That's your total cost. And the constraints are that when you add up, say, the amount of vitamin A in each food that you get, that should be in some acceptable range. Same thing for calories, fats, cholesterol, all of those things. And this was actually one of the very first um, linear programs that people tried to solve. The US Army um, tried to solve this during World War II to minimize expenditures on feeding the troops. But they didn't have very good methods for solving LPs back then. Um, so they did heuristics and everything was kind of by hand and very time consuming. The Soviets actually did have good methods, but they weren't published until after the war. So another example is airline ticket pricing, which can be confusing. Basically what airlines do is they engage in price discrimination. Um, a very simple example would be hardcover and softcover books. Publishers put out hardcover books <coughs> because they know there's some segment of the market that will pay more to get the book early, right when it gets published. And then after they capture that segment, they put out a, the softcover book, which um, more people will buy because it's cheaper. Airlines are doing the same kind of thing, but 
on like multiple axes. So people will pay more depending on how long before the flight they're buying. Uh, some people are just willing to pay more for a given ticket, and some people will pay more for first class versus cabin versus exit row, that kind of thing. So you do a lot of market research. You um, try to estimate how many people are willing to buy at each price, at each time, or each type of ticket. And then you can feed that into <coughs> a linear program where you're trying to maximize profits based on how many people will buy tickets at each price. And the constraints are you know, how many people are actually willing to pay at each price point. So that's how airlines try to squeeze some more money out of you. But we can also flip that around and look at it from the passenger side. So when you go on to Orbitz or Expedia or somewhere to select flights, what you're trying to do is find a route from point A to point B or F here. This is assuming that for some reason you want to fly from Reykjavik to the Kingdom of Tonga, which you can do in about five legs in two days. But this is only one way of doing it. There are many routes that you could take to get from point A to F. And so the problem is you want to minimize cost, or cost is adding up the cost of each leg. And the constraints define the network of available flights and the price of each of those flights. So basically that defines a graph where there are edges between locations and each edge has some price associated with it. This is one example of what's called a network flow problem, which can be expressed as a linear program. Um, that's a very big subject in itself. Lots of things are network flow problems. For example, routing packets over the internet, or um, coordinating a truck distribution network. And uh, that's all I have slides of, but there are many more things. LPs get used a lot in finance. Um, a common thing there is <coughs> trying to optimize your portfolio by minimizing risk while guaranteeing some expected return. Okay, so linear programs are excited are exciting because they can model lots of things, but also because you can solve them very, very efficiently. In fact, there are a couple of good algorithms for doing this. Um, the simplex method is the simpler one discovered earlier. That's exponential worth case time, but actually it's fast in practice on practical problems. So people still use this a lot. And basically it works by traversing the vertices of a feasible region until it finds the optimal point, which is always, always happens to be on a vertex. Interior point methods can travel through the interior region, and they have worst case polynomial time, which is very nice theoretically. I put n cubed up here, but the, um, the best known algorithms actually can use that exponent a little bit. But the, uh, the beautiful thing is that that's, you don't even really need to know any of that. You don't need to know anything about the algorithms. Um, there are lots of libraries that implement these for you. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, they're both open source and commercial ones. If any of you have used Excel Solver, that plugin, that's just a linear program solver. That's all it is. Um, for this talk, we're going to be focused on GLPK, the GNU linear programming toolkit, which is a, a C library that has simplex and interior point methods. So the idea is, you have a problem, and if you can express it as a linear program, you're basically done. Um, you just pass that to a black box solver like GLPK, and it gives you the solution. You don't have to do any kind of complicated algorithmic development. And uh, you can be confident that it will do a pretty efficient job of solving your problem, <coughs> as opposed to some ad hoc hand roll thing. Um, but what we're going to focus now on is actually this stuff, actually feeding that linear program into your solver library. Because there are some complications there, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean. 
So we'll use this as an example. It's a simple linear program. You have your objective function, your constraints. Um, so six constraints will mainly be focused on these three. These are, these are kind of trivial. And if you want to solve that using the GLPK library, it looks something like this. So, it looks like the same problem, right? <laughs> I mean, we will like see where all of this, this <coughs> comes from, but um, clearly this is not the ideal way to write out linear programs. Um, if you see this, you can understand you know what's being optimized and what constraints are, and it's very easy to make changes. See what's going on. With this, you kind of have to extract that reverse engineer. Yeah make your changes, and then transform it back into these CAPI calls. And it's not so complicated to do, but it is tedious, and it's easy to make errors. So we'd like to do something better. And what we really want to do is have a way of defining this problem to the computer that looks very much like this. Um, if it looks like this, then you can read it, understand it. It's easy to tweak it, add constraints as you need to. So what we need to write is a domain-specific language. Um, DSLs are kind of a hot topic. Um, they're, they tend to be focused narrowly on a particular domain, so you don't implement everything that you have in a general purpose language. That's, that's not the idea. It's really meant to be focused <coughs> doing something particular. And so, you know, big and complicated program, you could conceivably have multiple DSLs that you use for different pieces, and then you glue everything together with a general purpose language. So a DSL for linear programming, what we want is for it to look like the problem that we defined in the first place. And uh, you can divide DSLs into a couple of classes. So there are external DSLs, which are their own separate language. Um, so you have to write a parser for that. But the, the big benefit is that if you're designing an external DSL, you have complete control over what it looks like. So you can really tailor your, your DSL to your problem domain, to your heart's content. Um, the cons from a user perspective are that um, Pretty soon you'll run into the limits of that DSL in terms of what it can express. Um, I mean, that's partly intentional. These things are supposed to be tightly focused. But pretty soon you, you tend to see features creeping in like conditionals and looping. You know, all the niceties that a general purpose language gives you. And you also don't have access to the libraries for pulling in data from databases and all this kind of stuff. Um, another con is that you know, there is some cost, like there, there are benefits definitely, but there is some cost to pulling in lots of different languages into your project. Um, as a user, you have more of a learning curve because it's a kind of <coughs> syntax instead of conventions. Um, and if you're doing most of your work in a general purpose language, then you have to find some way of talking to this external DSL. So you have to take all your data format that into some bunch of text, pass it to your DSL, maybe that's a library call, maybe it's a binary and you have to do some IPC, and then you have to process the output to extract into data structures that your main program understands. So the alternative is to embed the DSL within some general purpose host language. Um, and this has some nice benefits. Uh, you don't have to do your own parser or anything. You just piggyback in the host language. You have very tight integration so that anything that the host language gives you, you can take that data and plug it into your um, problem domain. The big drawback is that you are limited by the host language in terms of what syntax you can use. <coughs> in this case, we're, we're fortunate because we're implementing a DSL in a mathematical domain. And this maps very easily onto the 
C++ built-in operators. You already have all of the basic math operators. They have the right precedence rules. And so there's not really much um, disconnect there. If you're doing some completely different kind of grammar that doesn't map so well onto C++'s operators, then you end up having to make some compromises. So something to keep in mind if you're doing this sort of thing. So um, I have to admit, I'm not the first person to think of making a DSL for linear programming. People have been doing this for decades. Um, so there, there are some major commercial ones, like AMPL, GAM, Cplex. These are all standalone languages where you write your program in this modeling language, feed it to their interpreter, it parses it, passes it to a solver, and gives you the result. Um, more recently, like in the last few years, um, there have been a couple of embedded DSLs that have uh, appeared for doing this. So the first one really was CVX for MATLAB. Um, and now, very recently, there's CVX Pi, which is basically <coughs> CVX ported into Python. Of course, the, the implementation is very different, but it's very much the same concept. And so the, li the library that I'm presenting here falls in this CVX tradition, and it's called CVX++. Um, so this is an example of one of the external DSLs. So as a user, you, you know, write it out in something very similar to the mathematician that we saw earlier. So this is pretty nice. And in CVX, it's pretty similar. So this is actually valid MATLAB code. Um, so the CVX was implemented by this um, guy, Mike. And I have, I really don't know how he managed to do this. MATLAB is a very quirky language, so this might be even more insane than doing it in C++. I don't know. So can we do this in C++? Um, the answer is yes, or I don't know. <laughs> So the, in this library CVX++, the problem looks something like this. I'm, I'm still tweaking the syntax a little bit, but basically you define your variables. You write out a C++ arithmetic expression that's like one and maximize. And same thing for the constraints. Yeah? What was the dumb question? Have you looked at using any C++ 11 features to enhance your grammar? Or find a, cl a clean looking syntax that you might want to play with, or has that not entered your thoughts yet? Um, I haven't looked at it very seriously yet. I think um, the most obvious feature that can, might help out some DSELs is the um, use defined literals. Because that will eliminate some of the math, you know, trying to do math to link a name up to a variable or something like that. I haven't looked at it at all. Um, so it's the relevant conversation any further though. Right. So. So, We'll get to, this is piggybacking on Proto, so I could easily imagine some features like periodic templates and that sort of thing creeping into Proto, which would be nice. But it's, it's not something that I've looked at very much yet. Um, so as I said, this is built using use Proto. And uh, in fact, doing this kind of thing in C++ has some advantages. Now you can do a lot of stuff actually at compile time. So at CVX and Python, everything is runtime, and you do all of your analysis and uh, problem transformation there. But um, in C++, it's actually possible to you know, verify that the problem is a correctly written linear program at compile time. And if it's not, you know, complain and tell the user to fix it. And you can do, we'll, we'll start seeing some of the transformations that you do. You can do at compile time to turn this into something that GLPK understands. So Boost Proto uh, builds itself as an embedded DSL for defining embedded DSLs. Uh, it lets you do so, some very cool things. Um, it will build expression trees for you. Um, you can use Proto to check that those expression trees conform to some grammar. 
you can apply transformations to those expression trees. And you'll see a couple of examples of this. So you take some, some expression tree and you literally like replace parts of it or turn into some other expression tree that then you can evaluate. Um, and so yeah, at the end you can, once you're done fiddling around, you can actually execute the thing and generate real code. Um, so, okay, here's what a, a simple expression tree looks like. This is the objective function from that simple LP that I showed earlier. So, 10 times x1 plus 6 times x2 plus 4 times x3. And Progo defines all these operators. So, it will build up this tree for you. And it knows the structure of this at compile time. So, it actually creates some complicated type to express this that looks like this. Um, so this is an expression that um, represents a multiplication. It has two children. Um, in proto, uh, terminal expressions are basically leap nodes of the tree. So one of them is a constant integer, the other one is a variable. So I, I've actually only represented like one small piece of this tree otherwise you wouldn't be able to read it. But you can imagine that you know, one layer higher up, you would have an expression with tag plus with two of these things as children, and so on. So we can build expressions, but um, so far, you know, anything that we throw in there will be built into an expression tree. We want to make sure that it actually is a valid inner program. So we, we define a grammar, has some production, production rules. Um, app by an expression is, just means something that's valid in a linear, linear program here. So it can be a constant, a variable. You can add or subtract two affine expressions. You can multiply an affine expression by a constant. And if we look back at this expression tree, like this, this conforms to the grammar. So variables are affine. You can multiply affine expressions by constants. You can add affine expressions together. So the whole thing is affine. And then a, a constraint just relates to these expressions. Now, in proto, proto gives you these this facility for defining a grammar, <coughs> where it actually looks very similar to what was on a couple slides ago. So this is a constant. Um, this is using some proto machinery to match anything that converts to double. And then variable I haven't spelled out here, but it's um, it's another terminal type that defines. <coughs> and then you can add, subtract, multiply by constants exactly what we saw in the grammar already. And then constraints, you define, I had a copy paste error there, but it's, it's essentially the same thing. And to validate that, you can do it at compile time. So if you're, as a user, you enter something that's wrong, that isn't only your program, um, it, it will refuse to compile and fail you know, as quickly as possible. So that just looks like that. This. You ask Proto to match the expression to your grammar rule, and it will attempt to do so, or return false if it can. <coughs> what does that look like? Just is it, is it, is it, is it, it doesn't, doesn't look right. Just compile it on it. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, um, yeah. Unfortunately, the uh, the comp compilation errors when you're doing this stuff are always pretty bad. But this is one of the things that I imagine would get better with C plus plus eleven because with a static assert you could get a nice textual error message instead of the okay. static stuff. That would be nice. So good reason for doing the loops instead of rolling by hand. We will get better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so because uh, my eyes start to bleed after a while. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so okay, so far we can we can build expression trees and we can um, check that they're valid. 
But we still need to turn this into something that GLPK understands. Um, so let's go back to um, my second slide where I said what a linear program is. We can rewrite this much more concisely just using this notation. So um, x is a vector of our variables. C contains the coefficients for the objective function. A is the coefficients of all of the constraints. And then you know, B also gets turned into a vector. And basically, GLPK wants a, us to give it A, B, and C. And then I can solve your problem. So if we look again at you know, the problem definition and the GLPK earlier, <coughs> this starts to make a little bit more sense. So you have your um, objective function, coefficients, you have your A matrix, and you have the, uh, the B vector that sets balance under constraints. Would you like a pointer? Hmm? Would you like a laser pointer? Oh, I'm, I'm OK. So we, we want to take all these constraints and construct these uh, this, make, this A matrix and vectors so we can give them to GLPK. So what we can notice is that um, for each constraint, each constraint divide, defines one row of A. So x1 plus x2 plus x3 is one one line in A, and so on. And then the, uh, the scalar value in that constraint <coughs> goes into the B vector. So the way that we can compute each row of A is we assign some index to each variable. And then we go through our expression, 10x1, 4x2, 5x3, and replace each variable with the unit vector or the index that we've given it. And so then you add that up, and you get the, what is that, the second row of A, then 4, 5. And this is exact, actually exactly what we're going to do. We're going to write a proto-transform that rummages through your expression tree, and whenever it finds a variable, it replaces it with a um, unit vector from boost 2 plus the matrix in the linear algebra library. Then we can just evaluate that, and we get a row of our matrix. So uh, now we get some, uh, now we start to have some fun. So we'll, we'll define a couple types up here. We have um, the u bus unit vector at to unit, and we wrap that into a terminal type, so we can hang it into a proto expression tree. And then we define this transform called coefficients. And uh, a transform is very similar to a grammar. If you look at these when statements, um, the first like, argument of that basically defines a grammar. So that's how it goes through the tree. But you can also define a second term, which is what you want to replace um, with the first, what you want to replace the first term with when you get a match. Um, Coefficients is actually much, much longer than this. It has a bunch of cases that needs to take account. But this is, the, this is the crucial stuff. So when Proto encounters a variable, it replaces that with a new terminal that is just wrapping a unit vector. Um, and these are other transforms that I'm not going to get into. But this basically returns the ID that we've given um, that variable. And then uh, where we also use this to figure out the value that goes into B, um, so the scalar value. And so when we find a free constant that's not multiplied by any variable, um, so let's say we have a constant <coughs> on the left and some coefficients on the right, then we subtract them to put them all on the same side of the um, inequality, and the free constant gets turned into that constant multiplied by a unit vector with index zero. So we, we say in, 
index zero is where all the scalar constants go. And then uh, we actually have things that we can pass to GLPK. So we have this constraint function with some arbitrary expression if um, does the transform that we just looked at and gets a coefficient vector. The zeroth element is the bound, which goes into B. Then we add a row to the GLPK problem. We um, set the coefficients. And we set the bounds of the, the bound that we extracted. Yeah. So the U plus unit vector is a compile time entity. I guess I would assume it was runtime. So um, it, it is runtime. So U plus unit vector is just this sparse vector object, and then uBloss defines its own hand-rolled uh, expression template mechanism. So what actually happens here is a little complicated. You have this um, proto-expression tree involving variables, and then you do a transform on it to turn those variables into vector objects. And then when you evaluate that, um, it stops being a Proto expression tree and turns into a uBloss expression tree because uBloss defines all these operators to build up its own expression tree. And then uBloss evaluates that into the result. Uh, so that's fun, but we can have even more fun if we add some functions that you can use when you're defining your problem. Um, so right, right now, the library has five of these. They're all pretty simple. There are a couple of more complicated ones <coughs> that I might, might add. But these are a good starting place. So absolute value, min-max, um, a couple of norms that uh, basically compose absolute value with another operation. And uh, basically the, the way that we handle these is we replace that function with a new variable, let's say y. And then we put constraints on y so that it matches the behavior of that function. So for absolute value of x, um, basically this is defined by two lines, plus x and minus x. And everything up there is in the feasible region, at least as far as this, this function is concerned. So we can replace absolute value of x with a new variable y and then add two constraints. So y is greater than positive x, and y is greater than negative x. And this accomplishes the same thing for the purposes of our opt optimization. Um, so for minimum, it's very similar. Um, you replace, they call it a minimum, with a new variable, y. And then you add a couple of constraints on y. So for the minimum, it's less than or equal to both arguments. And so this is, this is basically another search and replace operation. So it's perfect for doing a proto transform. So I'm, I'm not going to go through all of the machinery that goes into this, but basically we write another proto transform form that when it finds a function call, it replaces that with a new variable. And then it does some tag dispatch to the transform that implements that function. And then that transform adds constraints as necessary to make the behavior work. So I'll just show the, um, the last part of that. So for absolute value, um, this abs helper transform gets called at the end of the line. And basically, the, the three crucial lines are here. You create a new variable, this, this auxiliary variable. And then to your problem instance, you add two new constraints that use that variable. And we're using you know, the exact same syntax that you use to define um, the problem at the top level. So um, that's actually about all I've got. Uh, there's plenty of future work that can be done on the library, so matrix variables are probably the number one thing on the list. Um, 
you'd plug in some other solver backends, not just GLPK. Most of the front end stuff is pretty solver agnostic, so this should be very doable. And I'll just mention that uh, linear programming is, even though it's very widely used and very useful on its own, it's a small piece of a broader class of problems called convex optimization. And so as you broaden what you allow in your problem definition, um, it gives you some more flexibility of what you can do. So you can still solve these efficiently with interior functions. So like CVX and CVX pi actually <coughs> extend to doing convex optimization. That's the name CVX. Right, that's where CVX comes from. Um, and a lot of the front end stuff for that is already done. Um, your grammar gets bigger. You have to consider some some other kinds of expressions, con convex and concave expressions, and the rules for composing function calls get a little bit more complicated. But that's that's all in there. I'm just not using it right now. Um, and the code is available. It's on Bitbucket. It's not even that much code. I think it's might even be under a thousand lines. Um, Proto actually takes a lot of the boilerplate of doing this sort of thing. Cool. Any questions? So, is there any effort of like, unifying all the solver packages into one maybe convex programming library and then to boost? Maybe? So, there's there's kind of a um, a collection of packages that does this. Uh, it's called Coin OR. It's basically like the boost of operations research. So it collects a whole bunch of libraries that do optimization kinds of things. And so they, they do have some interface in there that um, abstracts over a bunch of linear programming solvers. So the next thing that I would probably do is try and hook CVX++ up to that interface and get access to a bunch of solvers all at once. Um, that so case, you have to like so you have to evolve the code for point to or as well, or you can you can really leave it like uh, so the user who is using this will have to get point point to or separately, or you will include it in one library. Um, I I thought about cleaning this up and submitting it to point to or. I mean it's it is organized kind of like Boost. It's a collection of libraries. Some of them depend on each other, but mainly it's a one-stop shop where if you need something in this area, you go see what Coin has. And uh, you know, if the dependencies are alright, you can still install all this stuff <coughs> separately. How about integer linear programming approaches? Is there any solvers for that? Yeah, GLPA also does an interlinear programming. Um, a bunch of these solver libraries also handle that. But that's not convex. Yeah. Okay, I'll pass your hand.